So thank you for the introduction, Megan, and I thank you for the opportunity to, to be here with you today to speak about something that I'm quite passionate about and, um, and uh, interested in. As Megan said, uh, the focus of today's meeting is on uh, adaptive civil culture to climate change. And uh, uh, Courtney is going to be speaking after me in terms of more of the focus on uh, civil culture itself. But the point of this talk is to provide some context on climate change, the type of climate change to be expected here in the Maritimes, the Acadian forest, and, and how that's uh, currently expected to affect our forest, and which connects with silver culture. So uh, I'd like to begin with uh, a bit about how much climate change we could expect, uh, the impact on the Acadian forest as we know it today, uh, knowledge gaps, and then uh, go into what we can do about it, which may include silver cultural elements. So well, I'd like to start with this slide in my talks, and, and, and there's a lot of local people here who have probably seen a few of my talks before, and I start with this slide, but this is the mean annual temperature of the, of the, of the world over the past 130 years for which we have uh, good actual measurements of temperature. And so what you're seeing here is not make-believe. These are real uh, compiled data. This, this particular source is from um, uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association in the United States. And uh, this is showing mean annual temperature from the 1880s all the way up to the present, including the year 2018, that last point on there. And I'm going to use my mouse a lot today to point to things. 2016 being the warmest point on record. And since the 1950s, you know, it's pretty clear that the change in, in temperature of the world over time. So make no mistake about it, the planet is currently warming. And what's driving this change in temperature? Well, it's um, primarily the greenhouse gases, specifically our, uh, our emissions of carbon dioxide. This is an interesting graphic from NASA, and it shows the uh, uh, estimated uh, atmosphere con uh, concentration of CO2 over the past 650,000 years, largely derived from ice core samples. And then we, we could see where our current composition is right here on this point here. We're currently sitting around 410 parts per million. And so we're at, currently, the concentration of CO2 is, is higher than any point over the past 650 years, according to our best proxy records. So it's, it's, it's significant, the amount of CO2 we currently have in our atmosphere. This is a little shorter time scale to demonstrate our impact, but this is uh, CO2 concentration uh, measurements from Mauna Loa um, Observatory in Hawaii, and uh, the kneeling curve, or summarized kneeling curve, uh, from 1960 up until the present date. And so you can see over the past 60 years uh, the change in atmospheric CO2 concentration in our atmosphere. CO2 is going up and it hasn't slowed down any. I remember when I first started looking at this stuff myself in the early 2000s and um, you know all the efforts and talk about what, what can we do, are we going to be able to you know, significantly reduce our emissions, but it hasn't changed a whole lot over that period of time. Well, has a decrease, I should say. So that's a little bit about global context in terms of climate. What about locally here in the Acadia Forest? So this is a, a, this graphic here is showing the historic and then projected change in mean annual temperature for the Acadian Forest. The black line here is showing change, historic temperature, summarized per decade over the last uh, from roughly 1850 up until the present. The little orange dot is the five-year uh, average in the, in the Acadian forest of, uh, of mean annual temperature, sitting around 5.9 degrees. The red line is the um, RCP 8.5, which is commonly known as the business as usual climate change scenario, which is, which is the directory we're on right now. And then the blue line is the more optimistic projection if humanity could really get itself together and uh, uh, adhere to the Paris Climate Agreement uh, is, is what the projected future climate would be, temperature that is. So you can see uh, the, the significant growth of projected temperature for this region, an eight degree change above the 20th century average to roughly about a, a mean annual temperature of 12 degrees by the end of this century. And even with the best case scenario, which is now unlikely, we're still looking at a potential, an increase of uh, roughly about three and a half degrees above the 20th century average. Um, this century. So potential big changes in, in temperature ahead. And to put that into context for you, 
by towards, towards the end of the century, that's like taking the climate of Virginia right now and, and us becoming that climate within the next, well, within the next 75 years. And, uh, and this is like, uh, I mean, I'm not a climate scientist. I mean, I, I, I try to uh, use climate science to, to do my work for ecology. But these are some of the best climate scientists in the world, and these are their projections for what's going to happen here. So it's something to take serious. Anyway, so that, that's some context in terms of the, the kind of climate change we can expect for our region. So what does that mean for our forest here in the Maritimes? And, and that's the main focus of this workshop here today. And so this is not actually a very easy question to tackle. It's a very healthy, faceted question. How will climate change affect our forest? One way I like to discern it is to think about the, the direct effects of climate on our trees and then the indirect effect of climate on our trees. And this graphic is supposed to sort of help relay that information. So the, the climate itself, climate directly affects the performance of trees, their growth, reproduction, survival, by affecting things like uh, rates of photosynthesis and respiration, phenology, the timing of bud burst and leaf oak, for instance. Um, climate directly affects the amount of moisture that's in the soil available to trees for growth. So these represent direct effects of climate on the performance of the trees that we utilize. But the climate also affects a lot of other things within the ecosystem as well that indirectly affect the trees. For instance, the climate is unlikely to affect all tree species the same way, which changes the interactions between tree species, or plant species that is. And the climate also affects things like forest insects and diseases in the forest. So changes in those can also change the, the, the trees that we depend on. And climate affects other things like other abiotic disturbances like fire and wind in the forest. So when thinking about how climate change affects the forest, we also have to consider these other aspects of the forest ecosystem and how they affect the trees. And to make things really complicated, these things affect the trees, but then the trees also affect these things again too. So there's lots of like interacting loops within a forest ecosystem. I like to say it's not rocket science, it's more complicated than that. Well, I didn't make that up. <laughs> I like to say it. Anyways, so what I wanted to do next was just to talk a little bit about uh, some of the, the direct effects of climate on trees and then some of the indirect effects. So let's begin with uh, the direct effect of climate on trees. So this is a, a, a map showing um, the major vegetation zones of the planet. And it's been known for some time. It's been known for quite a long time. And, and I mean, like a couple centuries, how, how climate has a strong control over the distribution of plant species on the planet. And, and this is quite evident when you look at a, a map like this and you see the bands of various types of vegetation. If, if, if you focus in on this area up here, uh, where we are, you can see, that, well, the way they have it in this map anyways, a, a band of where the real boreal forest separates from the boreal mixed wood temperate forest right here. And uh, there's one scientist in particular, uh, Ian Woodward, Woodward, I guess correctly, who uh, did a lot of work in the 80s and early 90s, and he published a really famous book in the late 80s, who focused specifically on trying to understand the effect of, of climate on uh, plant distribution. And from his work then and from pa papers now, it's well known that what forms these bands largely is cold tolerance and, and, and um, the effect of moisture availability on vegetation. So, so why is this? Well, why climate has an effect on plant species has something to do with something called uh, environmental niche theory. Uh, no species can be adapted to all environments. Just like people, no person can be good at everything. You have specialists like brain surgeons who are really good at that, but then probably couldn't fix a bicycle kind of thing. Or well, then you have jacks of all trades who are more generous. And when it comes to understanding organisms and our environment, it's the same sort of thing. Uh, species tend to be either specialists uh, uh, of all to certain environments, or some tend to be generalists, so they're good at a lot of things, but not, but not that good. And, and, and the same goes when it comes to trying to understand a species' uh, ability to survive at different climates. We have some species that are evolved to survive in the cold really well, such as our boreal cold adapted species, but that comes at a cost when, uh, when, you, when, you, when you evolve to become adapted to the cold or, or northern regions, you give up some things that make you less competitive and under warmer conditions. And this is an important concept to keep in mind, I think, when thinking about silviculture and how silviculture could be applied to deal with climate change, or when just trying to understand how uh, species respond to climate change. 
this little graphic that I put here together is put here is, is meant to sort of represent this. Um, each species has a specific climate niche and with multiple factors affecting um, how that species uh, is, is adapted to certain environments. And here is just a three-dimensional graph I put together showing three climate variables. And in each species, for instance, would have an area within that three-dimensional space where, it, where it's adapted to perform the best species performance. Using this type of uh, uh, reasoning and, and information, there are some scientists who put together uh, climate envelopes or climate niche models. And basically what a climate niche model is, is uh, we look at like where that species occurs on the landscape right now, where, where is it at, and then we look at well, the climate of where it's at, and then we correlate the two things. And we can develop a, a climate envelope out of that. This particular graph right here, the one on the left, or your, your right, I guess, um, is showing that the climate envelope for balsam fir. So the, the, the green area, well, all the colored areas are showing the climate that's most suited to balsam fir in, in North America. Not necessarily where balsam fir is, but where the climate is most suited to where balsam fir is. The one on the, uh, your left is showing where that climate space will be towards the end of the century under that RCP 8.5 one. So you can see how by the end of the century, if we continue with business as usual climate change, the climate that we think is most associated with growing good balsam fir has shifted north quite a bit. That's not to say that uh, balsam fir are all going to move. We will probably still have our balsam fir here, but the optimal environment to grow those balsam fir, at least climate-wise, is not going to be there. This is the same sort of figure for red oak. The, cl the current climate envelope for red oak right here and where it's projected to be um, by the end of the century under RCP 8.5. <clears throat> Does anybody have any questions about that so far? You, you have the drill work, but do you have, um, is it the same for fur as it is for spruce? It, I don't have it here. I, I, I actually, I do have it this computer. I can show it to you after. But it's a similar trend. Like um, for red spruce, for instance, on the map of North America, there's a defined climate space that's currently the best space for that. And then we can project where that climate space will be into the future. And it, it looks similar to the first situation. Um, you mentioned that, I mean, obviously the trees are not going to get up, uproot themselves and move just the climatic uh, char characteristics of the region will be inhospitable or less hospitable. What does that translate as? Reduced germination potential or increased susceptibility to freeze thaw cycles or all of them, all kinds of things? It, yeah, it could be a lot of those things and, and different ones for different species. Okay. One term I like to use just to sort of sum it up is the species performance, which includes like its ability to grow, survive, and reproduce. And each species, of course, has evolved differently for specific different climate kind of conditions. And as the conditions change, like just as this example is fur, as the, as, the, as the climate most suited to fur, at least according to this model, shifts, well then uh, the fur that are here, they now become, they're now maladaptive. They're not so well adapted. And, and, and for each species, it's, I guess it's, it's, it's different in terms of how that was specifically affected. Um, I'm not uh, familiar with your research, but I am familiar with the research of uh, Dr. Charles Gore. And I'm wondering if you can explain, do your, does your research, and do they confirm each other, or do they have wildly different results? Are you familiar with this work? I am, I indeed, yeah. And no, I would say for the most part, the, the, both pieces of work are in line with one another. Okay. Well, yeah, and um, and there's reasons for that that I want to get into at the end of this talk, uh, that's, which actually highlight where there needs to be improvement in the science. And so, but we'll get to that soon. So that, that little spiel was just to talk about the direct effect of climate on, on trees themselves. But let's just focus a little bit on the effect, the indirect effect of climate change on the trees. So uh, as the climate changes, it's going to affect some of the natural disturbances that we experience here in the Maritimes. Uh, this is a, a, um, a non-native species called Hemlock woolly adelgid that, that you've, a lot of you have probably heard about in the media and whatnot. And it's now in southern Nova Scotia. And this is a species that was introduced here in the 1950s, and it's made its way up the eastern seaboard over the past 50 years. And 
one of the things that about this species, at least what the entomologists tell me, is that, uh, is that uh, wintertime temperatures actually do keep this thing to the south, constrained. And uh, specifically, uh, if you look at this top map here, this is showing isotherms of mean annual temperature currently. And especially uh, uh, average wintertime temperatures of minus five seem to be where the insect that stays below that isn't like colder than that at wintertime and it interferes with its life cycle. And so if you look at this map here, you can, this is, and this is where the insect is currently moved to, is southern Maine and into uh, southern Nova Scotia, and which share a similar mean wintertime climate. If you look at this map down here, this is showing the mean, mean wintertime temperature by the end of the century under RCP 8.5. And you can see how that <laughs> minus five isotherm where it's like to go beyond has now shifted quite a bit. And so uh, now the insect has free reign over uh, much of New Brunswick as well. So it's, it's just an example of how as the climate sh shifts, it could affect uh, other things within the ecosystem. Another example is uh, wildfire. We don't commonly associate wildfire with the Maritimes, uh, at least not now because of our, our more wet climate here. But it is something to consider into the future as the climate warms. And this map here is showing um, homogeneous like fire zones in Canada, and the more red, the, the more area burned per year by fire. And this is some work from a colleague at the CFS, and um, this map on your left is showing, on your right rather, is showing uh, fire zones currently, and this map here is showing fire, where the fire, how the fire zones will change towards the end of the century under RCP 8.5 again. And so if you look down at the Maritimes here, uh, it's relatively light colored, which means we don't get a lot of annual burning from fire. But by the end of the century, according to this study, we could see a potential increase in the amount of area burnt by fire. So another aspect to think about. So there's, there's a lot of pieces to the puzzle, as a, and that's the point I'm trying to hit home here. And, uh, and so we have tools at our disposal, disposal to help integrate this information and try to, to make a projection about how the forest will change. And that's where ecosystem modeling comes into play. And, and this is where a lot of my own work focuses. And what I like about ecosystem modeling is it gives us an opportunity to provide a framework to take these various pieces of empirical information that scientists have been working on and integrate them together into a, like a virtual uh, forest ecosystem and then run that system over time under various stimuli, whether it be changes in climate. And that's what this graphic here is meant to represent. Uh, taking an actual piece of forest real estate and representing it within a computer program and trying to incorporate all our best biology and ecology with how that system works and then use that information to make projections into the future. So this is a piece of work that we did a few years ago, something similar, something like this. And, and we specifically focused on the Acadian forest. So what we did in this piece of work here is we picked a a thousand different points across the Maritimes, across the Acadian forest, uh, plots, and at, at each point we simulate a one hectare uh, forest. And we simulated it until the end of the 20, uh, 21st century, and we did it under different climate change scenarios. And then we looked at how the model predicted uh, the change in climate would affect changes in species composition and species growth. And what we found, uh, according to, to this study, was uh, in the short term, the model we were working with wasn't able to detect any significant changes up until the year roughly 2050. But once you get past the year 2050, under the RCP 2.6, the best case scenario, we, we didn't detect any significant changes from today's forest. But under RCP 8.5, the business as usual scenario, we, the model began to uh, detect some significant changes in structure and function over time. Specifically, changes and uh, a decline in the abundance of cold adapted tree species, arboreal species, uh, increases in warm adapted temperate species, and something that we're referring to as a deboralization of the Acadian forest. <coughs> Just to graphically represent that, this pie chart is showing the uh, composition of all those plots currently. And as you can see, there's a, a, a big chunk of the pie is balsam fir and spruce. And, and I, I compare this graphic with other estimates of the current composition of the Acadian forest. And roughly, the Acadian forest does comprise roughly about 50% uh, fir and spruces. So there's a lot of fir and spruce here. This is, the, this is what it, the model projected the forest would become by the end of the century uh, under that RCP 8.5 climate change scenario. 
And so this, this model really loves red maple. It's saying it's, it's really going to increase. But the, the main point of this exercise in this graphic here is that it's showing a, a reduction in cold adapted species, specifically uh, fir and spruce, and an increase in warm adapted species, specifically in this case, red maple. And I think it has a large, largely to do with the fact that red maple is such a generalist species, and hence why the, the model liked it so much. In terms of forest growth estimates for the Acadian forest, um, this gray bar that you see here is an error, an error envelope. So anything, anything within that 10% envelope, area envelope, we just ignore. But any, any kind of single outside of that uh, is significant according to the model. And so in the short, short term, until the year 2050, uh, the model is projecting a, a, a potential decrease in the productivity of our forest. But by the end of the century, under RCP 8.5, uh, a significant decrease in, in the growth of our forest. Is that, sorry, is that based on the current like 50 percent spruce fir, or is that <coughs> accounting for the, the separate species that are going to fill in that gap? Well, yeah, it's accounting for all the species that are here, and, and, and it's accounting for uh, <coughs> the potential change in species composition as well, an increase in the uh, warm adapted species and decrease in the cold adapted species. And, and this also, I, I should say that this graphic here is. It's comparing current growth rates with projected future growth rates. So uh, an 18% decrease compared to current growth rates in the short term, and a 40% decrease in growth rates in the long term. So anytime you're doing this kind of work, though, you want to try to understand well, why is the model saying this? So, um, in terms of the compositional shifts that the model is projecting, what's driving this in the model that we're working with is mainly interspecific competition, changes in the relative competitive rates of, of tree species. Some species are becoming more competitive, and other ones are becoming less competitive, and that's driving changes in composition. And this point specifically has implications, I think, for silvicultural <coughs> research, because oftentimes when we're doing silviculture, it's to help uh, control for competition or use competition elements to our advantage. And so that may be something to consider. The, the change in, in growth that the model is uh, projecting is largely due to the direct effect on, on uh, climate on some of the tree species. Some of the tree species in there are being penalized because it's getting warmer. And the other thing that's driving the, this large uh, reduction in growth that the model is predicting is this blocking mechanism within the model, which, it, which kind of sets up a neat hypothesis to test the real, but it's the fact that so much of the forest right now is already occupied by spruce and fir. And the, the kind of rapid climate changes that we're projecting, they're going to happen really quick over the next 50 years. And so it's not like um, the spruce and fir can get out of the way for the better adapted, uh, warm adapted species. And so even though like the, uh, the, the, the deciduous maples and oaks, they're here and they might do better under this warmer climate, there's just not enough of them to make up for the potential loss of the cold adapted species. And also, I, I, I like to hit home from this work that it's not, we're not suggesting that balsam fir and spruce will disappear from the landscape, but they may become increasingly maladapted to the climate that, that's going to uh, become our region. So how do our results from this particular study align with other modeling studies out there? So here's a, uh, just a small list I put together of three other studies, uh, Charles Bork's study at UMB being one of them, another study of the US, and, and another colleague in CFS, both doing um, similar type of modeling work, but completely independent, and also with different ways, the different types of models. And all of them coming up, though, with similar types of outcomes in terms of declines and the old adaptive boreal species and increases in some of the warm adaptive species. This specific figure on the uh, left right here is a, is a piece from Megan's report which probably will be something that you guys use today, maybe in your workshop. But it's, it's comparing um, a piece of work that the Fundy uh, Biosphere Reserve did on this column right here, our work, uh, Taylor et al., and then Bork's work. And it's comparing uh, whether each study predicted an increase or decrease in each tree species. It's quite a list of tree species here. And it's interesting to see uh, how the results compare. And for the most part, I'd say there's a, a lot of agreements, specifically on the, these ones that are highlighted here in red, like balsam fir, red maple, an increase in red maple, and a, a decrease in, in white spruce. So, so that's comparing it with modeling studies. But what about other and actual empirical studies? Studies on the ground now that are trying to measure, can we see changes in tree species composition already? And um, there are studies slowly 
uh, being published now that are beginning to detect some of the changes that these models are, pr are predicting. And the one I want to highlight here is a high impact paper uh, published two years ago by Fay et al. out of Purdue University and the journal Science. And this graphic's a little bit uh, complicated, but I'd like, to, I'd like you to take a few minutes to try to understand it. So this figure here, where my mouse is, is showing the, the, the actual change in uh, temperature over the past 30 years in the U.S., in the eastern U.S., with the blue area showing actually cooling and the red area showing a warming. And this figure here is showing the change in precipitation over the past 30 years, where the purple, bluish colors are places that are getting wetter, and the more uh, umpire colorblind, the brown, green areas are getting drier. So, so this is the actual, actual changes in climate are taking place within the eastern uh, U.S. over the last 30 years. And what they did is they went and they looked at all the permanent forest permanent sample plots that are across the eastern U.S., and there's thousands of them, and they looked at how the changes, uh, how the, the abundance of tree species, in terms of saplings and belts, how they've changed over that 30-year period. And they had these neat little rose diagrams down here. I'm just going to focus on this one right here. And the way these rose diagrams work is it's like a compass with north pointing up, south pointing down, east and west here. And each piece of the pie is showing um, um, if the pie is bigger, then more species are changing, shifting their abundance in that direction. So if you look here, there's a big shift in the pie here. This piece of the pie is really big. It's because the data is actually showing a shift in species abundance towards the northwest. And this, this is for all stems. This is just focusing on saplings here, where we're, we're, we're seeing what, what they found in this paper was a general shift northward and westward of, of species composition. And I tried to uh, write down the main points right here. Um, one, one thing that was interesting was they found that 71% uh, of the gymnosperms, the conifers, have sh are, are shifting northwards, which is kind of what we'd expect according to some of the modeling studies. So anyways, this is a high-level piece of work that's showing that there is actually some change that's taking place that seems to be correlated with changes in climate. However, anytime someone presents you with these kind of modeling results, you should take it with a grain of salt and, salt and think critically about what people are suggesting to you. So I want to go back to our environmental niche theory that we talked about earlier. So anytime we're doing this kind of work, the idea is to better understand this, this niche. What, how does each species respond to changes in these various environmental factors, such as like uh, changes in mean summertime temperature or minimum winter temperature? Each species has evolved to, uh, to a different combination of these things. And I would argue that right now, actually, our knowledge of um, maximum summertime temperature is still quite weak. I think that we have science has better understanding of the cold limits of tree species performance, whether it be growth or reproduction. But in terms of species uh, limits, in terms of warming, I'd say our knowledge is much weaker. And when we do these models, whether it be a Bork's work, my own work, or others, a lot of them are currently based on that climate envelope stuff that I talked about. And uh, the climate envelope stuff is very uh, well, correlated. And uh, the warm limits that are associated with that that we use in our models are where we build those warm limits based on we know the species only goes down so far so. This is the climate that by itself, so we figured this is the limit of you know where that species could be. But but in reality, that it might not be in equilibrium, and some of these species may be able to handle a, a lot a lot more warmth than uh, what we what we know about. And so we need to increase our understanding of how species respond to these various environmental factors. What time am I supposed to finish? Okay, I just want to go back to one figure here. <clears throat> speaks to that point I'm trying to make. This figure here was at the world and Ian Woodward's work. And so when, when you look at those bands of major vegetation types around the world, yeah, coal tolerance is really well known to, to drive the northern limit of what you see. Like if you look here where my mouse is pointing right now, um, it's, it's actually, there's a specific isotherm, I forget if it's minus 40 or whatever it is, but there's a certain temperature threshold that you hit that all of a sudden a lot of species, especially specifically temperate deciduous species, they can't, they can't do their work once, you get, once it gets colder than that. They don't got the biochemistry inside to handle that kind of freezing, so they fall out. But the conifers 
and, and also a couple of the citrus species, Bruce and Asp, but they, they do have differences in the way their cells work to handle the, the cold freezing. So you see them making, they're able to, to populate further north, and has, that's what drives that band north. But, but what's less known is though, this is what stops the deciduous trees from going north, the cold, but why, but, but we still have the conifers further south. So why, why aren't they more abundant farther south? Why don't they take over from the deciduous species? And so it, the southern limit of these major bands is what's less known, but it's hypothesized that competition really comes into play then. And so you could have white spruce perhaps growing in someone's garden in Virginia, but if you, in a natural situation, it's probably it's really out of its element, and it probably, it's probably less competitive than the species that are native that are that can grow and take advantage of that climate. So it's, it's not competitive. So they think that competitive interactions are what um, limits us seeing more of those cold boreal species further south. And I think that's also uh, an important point for silviculture. So again, it's like maybe we, we want to continue to grow red spruce in our forests uh, 50 to 60 years down the road from here. So and maybe we can. Maybe they can grow under the warmer conditions. They might not compete as well. So if that's the case, then uh, maybe thinning becomes more of a priority. Anyway, so like, like I was saying, we, we, we don't know as much about the warm limits of many of the species, which actually impedes our modeling work that we can do. But there are studies underway to help with this. And this is a nice study I want to highlight by uh, a new professor at, at the University of Brunswick, Lowe's Orangeville, and Nature last year. And it's a really uh, comprehensive study that them took over 270,000 uh, tree cores from across Quebec in um, a, a pile of work. and. Uh, and then use those tree cores to look at uh, changes in uh, species growth. So they had six species, and they collected uh, thousands of tree cores from each species across the entire area of Quebec. And that entire area of Quebec spans quite a, quite a latitudinal gradient, climatic gradient, a change in approximately 11 degrees in annual temperature. And also, there, there, this represents this big area, quite a wide gradient in, in moisture as well. And so where you have so many measurements of tree, individual species tree growth across such a broad uh, climatic range, and you could begin to try to narrow in on uh, some of these specific climate growth relationships I'm talking about. And this is the uh, graphic from this paper that really intrigued me. So this is showing um, growth rate for each of these six tree species um, for two climatic variables that, that were uh, powerful, that were uh, significant in his models. Um, maximum annual temperature, and then a climate moisture index, which is a measure of uh, moisture availability to, to the species. And I, I just wanted to focus in here specifically on white spruce. So it, when he looked at all of those tree rings across that big range of climate, what, he, what they found was that as temperature increases across that range, you see these are contour maps, or heat maps are called, and the lighter the color, the higher the number, and the, the darker the color, the, the lower the number. And as you increase the temperature, you get an increase in growth, but then a decrease in growth as you get, as you get even warmer. So there's a real parabola or humpback shape there for the temperature of white spruce, and somewhat of a relationship with, with moisture. If we look at balsam fir down here, um, maybe that the hump with temperature is not quite as strong, but what is more Maybe more, more powerful though is the change with balsam firs growth potential with uh, moisture. As you go down to uh, the negative temperatures here on the moisture axis, which is drier, you see then a decrease in the growth of balsam fir. Anyway, so these, this represent a, represents an example of the type of empirical work needed to be done to better understand those specific climate growth relationships. And uh, Loic used this work to make some projections of how. Uh, climate may affect the future for, uh, forests of Quebec, uh, specifically the, uh, uh, the growth of each one of those species. I'm only going to focus on just uh, maybe white spruce because I think it's all we have time for. But if you look here at this figure here, this is for white spruce. Um, if you focus on this specific graph here, this is, this is what the growth rate of white spruce is projected to come if, we, if the climate in this area warms by 4 degrees and precipitation remains the same. And the more red it is, means there's a more, I think that's red, as a more of a decrease in growth. And, and that's what his results are showing, is that if he uses those relationships that he found, if he projects into the future, um, he, it's showing 
for southern for the southern boreal in Quebec, a decrease and white a, de a decrease in the growth of white spruce, and the same with balsam fir as well. And of course, we're south of that area here in the Acadian Forest. So you know, I, I imagine that effect would be really extreme for us. So we have other studies that are currently underway to better help understand these climates, uh, growth, climate performance relationships. And there's a couple I, want, I just wanted to highlight. The uh, one is within my own lab in collaboration with UMB in, in the province of New Brunswick, and where we're uh, looking at collecting what we have collected uh, uh, plot data, forest plot data from across eastern North America, from Quebec and Ontario, all through the Maritimes down to Florida. And each one of those plots, there's thousands and thousands of plots that cover that area, we have measures of uh, DBH growth. And, we're, and, and this big area also covers the range of, of many tree species from north to south, and also covers a wide gradient of climate. So we're currently trying to like disentangle within all that data, can we find the relationship between a climate and species performance. Another study underway, which um, again, which involves Lowick, which we just submitted uh, a, a proposal for for funding, is to set up um, specific sites along the same sort of latitudinal gradient of climate, eight, 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 eight potential sites right now, and in each one of these sites, we would actually establish a plantation where we would uh, grow certain tree species, maybe certain families of tree species, to see how, again, to see how differences in climate, which we control for everything else, may affect the performance of tree species. And we currently have an in-house experiment the guy actually doing the work is sitting up there in the lab straight. <laughs> uh, where we're doing something similar, but we're trying to do it in-house. And we, where we've built some small greenhouses. This is an example of one of them right here. And each one of these little greenhouses we're controlling for temperature and soil moisture and also carbon dioxide concentration to see how these various factors influence the early growth and survival of, well, this is red maple here, but a number of different tree species. So there's currently uh, a lot of work underway to try to better quantify these relationships, which is critical to if we're going to try to make more accurate projections. So anyway, so, so what does all this mean for the local forestry sector? Well, in terms of some of the modeling work we've done thus far, if we could, if humanity could keep everything to RCP 2.6, maybe it would be minimal changes to the forestry sector here in the Maritimes. But if we keep going the way we're going right now under RCP 8.5, there's potential major changes coming in forest composition for the region and potential decreases in forest growth. So implications for wood supply. And where it's increasingly unlikely that we're gonna be able to meet that RCP 2.6 uh, scenario, we should begin to really consider preparing for more of the RCP 8.5. So what can we do about some of these things? Well, the biggest thing I think that we should be doing is, is trying to mitigate more, reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, Megan alluded to earlier uh, pro-carbon forestry, using forest ecosystems to our advantage to help absorb and store more carbon. There's a really neat study actually in the news this past week about uh, movement of Australia. We're now able though to um, sequester carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, turn it back into coal. I don't know if anyone's seen that, but it sounds like a really promising technology. But those are all related to the mitigation side of things. But there's very likely we're gonna see changes no matter what, and so we need to prepare and adapt such things in terms of adaptation actions, assisted migration, AV proactively uh, looking into uh, moving species or, or genotypes of species that are currently here further north. Adaptive silviculture, the theme of this workshop is another option. Or and also looking into alternative forest products for our region. And the other thing that we should be doing continually is monitoring programs, monitoring uh, changes in our forests over time. Um, more of these experiments and field studies that I alluded to just earlier, and then using this new information to improve our ability to forecast what the future forests will look like. So that's all I have. Thank you.